All right. Welcome everybody to the webinar today. We're happy to have everybody here. Hope everybody is doing well. Um, and what we're going to talk about today is going to be really the basics on setting up your bill of materials and your bombs in all orders and understanding um, and just covering um, a lot of the different uh, options that we have with setting up your bill of materials. So in all orders, as I'm sure many of you are aware, we do cover um, we try to cover a lot of the aspects of production that you might need to track and it all starts with your bill of materials. So before you get to the point where you're putting in your work orders and tracking of your production, we want to make sure that your bill of materials is, is set up. And this is really your, your recipe, your default recipe for how your items uh, or your assemblies are built and produced. What raw materials do you go through on a typical build out that you would do of that, of that assembly? Um, while we understand that there's uh, going to, of course, be variations as you're building it, we want to have the defaults in there so that generally the user has to do as little work as possible when they're actually trying to specify which materials and components have been consumed. So at its most basic, when you're in all orders and you're creating a new item, if it's part of any group that is of the assembly type, right, so we support multiple item groups existing within the system. So if the type of the group is assembly, you'll see that you'll have this bill of materials tab that becomes visible and available for you to click on where you can start to manage and edit your bill of materials. If I click on, and now when you first create a new item, this whole area right here will be blank because you won't have any bill of materials set up. When you click on the edit bill of materials button, you'll get into our bill of materials editor. Okay. And there's two grids on here, which will be the main areas you'll be entering data. The grid at the top will have the steps that are involved in your production process. Now this confuses a lot of people. We have some people who start using the software and they start to put in steps for the different things they're gonna be using up. Um, the only time you need to use steps is if you wanna be able to track where in the production process your assembly might be at. Okay, so let's say uh, it's not something that gets just put together or packed in a bag or a box together. Um, or something that takes just a few minutes. Let's say it takes a week, a month, maybe it goes out to a third party. You want to be able to keep track of where in the production process is this particular assembly at. You want to define steps in the system and list them here on the top grid of your bill of materials along with a description and a location. The location is actually very key. If you have multiple warehouses where you might be storing inventory that would be used up for the production process and depending on where that assembly is in production, you need to make sure that the location assigned to that step is accurate. Whatever location is on that step, that's where the inventory is going to get consumed from. Uh, we get asked a lot about third-party contractors or vendors that, that are performing some type of services. Maybe they're holding inventory for you at a location you set up. Well, then they would have a step. You would have a, a step set up for that particular vendor. Their location and your location list would be assigned to that step. And that way, if they're holding any of your inventory, when you're in production, it's going to consume the inventory that they're holding on for you. Okay. In addition, we have a couple of options here for tracking time uh, where you could specify how much time it generally takes, uh, how many hours or minutes or weeks, etc., different time-based units of measure. Um, and then we'll have some totals on here where we'll show, based on the components you're putting and assigning on each step, the total cost of the parts, the non-parts, and then the total cost altogether. So you're probably noticing as I'm clicking on the different steps that it's actually swapping out the component list on the bottom. So each one of the steps can have its own set of components. I have a lot of people who come in and they click on the bottom of the step. And they say, what happens to all of my components? Well, that's because it's waiting for you to enter a new one and then to begin entering a new list of components for that step. But if I click on any of the existing steps, I can see all the components associated with those. If you need to define new steps that are not in your system yet, You'll be able to do that from the list menu, profile list, production, and then steps. All right, and that's where you'll be able to define new ones. Each step will have a name, you can give it a description, and then a location where that step of production would be taking place. And that's going to pull directly from your location list 
located over here. Once you have your steps set up in the bottom grid, you'll be putting any components, any raw materials or items or even sub-assemblies. So we, the all-order system supports an unlimited number of sub-assembly levels. So if you have nested assemblies, whips, whatever you might refer to them as, um, we have an unlimited level of those. So as you're structuring your bill of materials, you are able to have other assemblies located within them. As an example, on this one, I have this zero assembly located right here. That's another assembly that I have. And at any time, if I have a sub-assembly and I need to take a look at it or edit it, here in the details dropdown, there'll be this bomb option, which will bring me directly into the bill of materials editor for that particular assembly. Now I'm modifying the bill of materials for the sub-assembly. You might also have noticed that when we were looking at the list of components here on the main item editing screen, that there's this icon right here. That will also be a shortcut to bring you directly into edit the bill of materials for that particular sub-assembly and so on and so forth. So if this, uh, if this particular sub-assembly has another level of sub-assembly going down, you'll be able to continue to go down the chain, continuing to uh, update the bill of materials as you go. When you're entering your components, uh, there's a couple of pretty straightforward options on here. We've got the item, uh, which will be your, your item from your item list, the purchasing description. The bomb description is, is a description that is editable. So I can come in here and edit the description and put anything that I want in there. So that's going to be unique to that particular bill of materials. We want the purchasing description to kind of stick. That's your standard purchasing description you have on file for the item. But if you want to put some type of description or notes for a very particular bill of materials and, and component on a bill of materials, that would go inside of the bomb description. We'll have a column over here where you can see the quantity currently available and stock for production. And then we've got the quantity that's used um, each time you build a single unit of the assembly. So you want to try to think to yourself, um, depending on the different measures you have set up in the system, um, for each one of the, this particular assembly, how many of this unit, how many units of this particular component do I consume for each one of those? And this, again, this is more like a recipe. When you actually go and cook in the kitchen, you might add a little bit here or there, maybe some stuff drops on the floor. It's the same idea. These are just your defaults. When we actually get into the production, aspect of things and we start building out the documents, we'll be able to modify the quantities as needed, add a component, remove a component, etc. So this is our these are our defaults. You'll also notice here we have a unit of measure. And this unit of measure is actually um, able to be different than the standard unit of measure you have in the system. So let's say uh, nails as an example. Let's say I, I stock my nails in boxes of 12. And so when I buy them or I look at my inventory, I'm looking at how many boxes of nails I have. But perhaps I want to use it on a work order, right, when I'm doing my production as each is. Every single component that I have that can be listed on a, on a bill of materials it has the capability of, of having its unit of measure being overridden from the primary unit of measure. And the way that you can do that is by going into the item editor and inside of the other tab over here, we've got this used as unit of measure. So if I was on a component right now, and perhaps I think the most popular uh, thing to do here is, is when we see components being uh, used in weights. So if we have uh, pounds and kilograms or grams, um, things like that we see very frequently, um, or in gallons or quarts. So you might stock it in something like a gallon or use it in the pound, whatever it might be. So here I can override the primary measure and say, well, for this particular raw material, whenever I use it on a work order, I'm going to use it by the kilogram and the conversion rate that I have to move it out of the primary measure and into this used as measure might be, you know, whatever, whatever that number is, you know, you do the math, you put it in, and now whenever I put this component onto a bill of materials, it's going to go by that used as unit of measure. We'll also have the cost available on here. And by default, that's going to be the standard cost that we have. The reason we have the standard cost, and we get asked the question a lot, um, and it's here, it's on the work order, is because when you're putting together your bill of materials and when we're going through the production process, we don't necessarily know what the value you know, is, is, of that inventory is. And that's really how we like to differentiate it. Are we talking about the cost 
or are we talking about the value? When you're actually going through production and we're pulling units out of inventory, well, then there's a value involved. Then we're talking about some specific units that have been in inventory, whether we're using average cost or we're using FIFO. Then we can run reports and we can see the value of those units. But when we're just putting together a bill of materials or we're just initially starting a work order up, we don't really know what the cost is going to be or what the value more more towards the value. So when we put cost on here, we're really going off of the standard cost, which is something you can modify in the system. So so any item that you're defining that's like a part or non inventory item, you have the ability in the purchasing tab to specify the cost right over here. Or you might have your vendors listed and costs associated with them there. And that's like the estimated standard cost that you have on file. That's what we're going to show you on your bill of materials. So if you're ever looking at your bill of materials, you're wondering where that cost is coming from, that's where it's from. And that's going to be our, our way of estimating the total cost for how much it would, you know, what it would cost you to build one unit of this particular assembly. When you're actually doing the building, it will likely be different because then it will really depend on the actual value of the inventory units being pulled. Then we'll roll that up and that'll be the, the value of the assembly being built. The one-time checkbox right over here is going to be for any components where no matter how many of this assembly you're going to be building, we only want it to be calculated one time. So, for example, these nails right here at the top, it's got a quantity of one. I'm telling the system that for every unit of this NC bot that I built, I need one nail. So if I build 500 bots, I need one nail. I need 500 nails. If I put 10 in here, then it's going to it's going to be a multiple of 10 so it's going to be 500 10 for each one it's going to be 5000 and so on and so forth if i don't want that multiplication to happen i could put a quantity in here mark it as one time and no matter how many of the nc bot i build it's always going to only use 5 units uh, we see this a lot of times when there's prep work that has to happen for the production process you want to track the cost or any, any inventory maybe you use up as part of that prep work. But once the prep work is done to prepare the machine or the station or whatever it might be, that's it. You can make one, you can make 500, you can make 10,000 units. Um, we don't want that to continue to multiply. That's the type of component you would mark as being a one-time component. By default, all of your components will be costed. And they're all going to get rolled up into the cost uh, of what it, what it costs you to actually build each unit of this assembly. If, for whatever reason, you have a component where you don't want that to roll up, maybe somehow you're, you're, you're putting that on the books somewhere else, or for whatever reason, you don't want that cost to roll into the cost uh, for that item that you're building, all you have to do is uncheck the box for being costed, and it will remove it from the overall cost when we actually post the, uh, the entry into QuickBooks. It won't go into the value of that, of that particular item. We've got these up and down arrows over here. If we want to move components up and down the list, and then the details we can use to insert and delete lines. Now, a couple of uh, options on here that are not so frequently used that we're going to cover. Okay, we've got this use quantity as a percentage. Now, if you do anything with, uh, definitely the most popular is when we're dealing with like weights and liquids and things like that, uh, where you might be producing a pound or a gallon of something. And instead of entering the fractions and whatnot, that each component will be, you want to enter as a percentage of the overall mix and you're, you're making batches, let us know. We can help you set that up. There's a couple of options we have with using the quantities as percentages. Um, it can be as straightforward as clicking the checkbox here, right? So for this particular item, there's, there's a couple setup things that you need to do, um, but it can be as simple as checking the box and then instead of a quantity, you would just be entering a percentage. And then whatever the item is, let's say it's a pound, it would be, if I put 25 and there would be 25% of a pound that would get used up from inventory. Um, so let us know if you're interested in exploring something like that. Um, the loss factor over here, um, you're able to put in, and what that will do is that will say that we're planning that when we put this item actually into production, there's going to be a certain amount of loss that we're expecting to have. So even though I'm putting in my default bill of materials with maybe one unit here, three units there, I want to assume that I'm going to go through a certain percentage over that inventory. So when I'm going and actually pulling inventory and the system is telling me how much to go and take, I want an additional percentage because I know I'm not, if I just do the standard bill of materials, I'm not going to have enough. So that's a way that you can put in just a, a standard bill of materials with quantities and still have an extra kind of like a safety 
uh, percentage that goes over the top. So when I drop this on a work order and put it into production, that extra percentage will be added on top. The batch size option is to say that when I enter my bill of materials, I want to enter it not to build one unit of the item, but I want to enter it to build 50 units of the item. Perhaps I have uh, my bill of materials set up where some of the items that are in are super small amounts or it's set up for a particular number being produced. And then I have to sit and do the math to say, okay, how am I going to back this out and get the numbers for what I want to produce just one individual unit. But it would be a lot easier if I could put in my bill of materials with the batch size being what I already have my formulas in. Well, then all you would have to do is set the batch size here at the top for however many units you're going to actually put the bill of materials in for. And then by default, when you're creating work orders, we're going to assume it's going to be for that batch size. And if you have to go smaller or larger, we'll be able to do the math for you. So a lot less work trying to get your formulas into the system if you enter your batch sizes. We'll probably cover the phantom bombs in one of the more advanced production webinars. I think we'll probably get into some of the some of the work order stuff and some of the more advanced options with that. Um, and then we'll get into what phantom bill of materials are. Here at the top, we've got an option for instructions. This will, of course, copy onto any work orders, any forms or templates you print out of work orders. So make sure you enter in your instructions for your bill of materials. And this is a pretty new option. Um, we had a bunch of requests and we finally got to it where um, a lot of our users will have bill of materials for some of their items that are really close to the bill of materials they want to use for additional items they're going to be putting into the system. And it was a lot of work for them to build the bill of materials out from scratch or to export and import. And so now we've got this copy button you can use and it will bring you a list of existing assemblies in the system. And you can check a box for any of them. And what that'll do is take the current bill of materials on the item and overwrite it with the bill of materials from that particular assembly. So that's a nice new feature that we've actually got. You can also do that here under the production and then bulk update bill of materials screen. So let's get into that for a moment. This is a bit of a hidden option that a lot of our users don't really know about, but it's really, really powerful. So if you're ever in a situation where you've got a bunch of bill of materials hanging around the system and you really need to update them, and maybe there's a couple of particular components um, that really have to get changed, um, this would be one of the best screens to do it, where you can avoid opening all the individual items or exporting and importing. Okay, and we've got four main options on here. We'll go through each one. The first option is the replace. If I have a component in the system that is no longer going to be used, but it's got a new replacement, there's a new part that's replaced it, it's an updated version, maybe there's a supplier that no longer provides the one that I need, um, and now I put a new item into the system, I can put in the top the component that I want to replace. Then in the next drop down, I can select which component I'm going to be replacing it with. And then I can either pick specific assemblies in my item list that I want to update, or I can click Add All to say I want to take every single assembly in the system that has the component I want to replace in its bill of materials, and I want to replace it with the new component. And then when you click Process, it will actually update all those bill of materials for you. You can see here at the bottom we also have an option not only to update the bill of materials, but also to search for that component on any open work orders that have not yet been put into production and to swap out the item there as well. There's a couple other options here that are a little bit unique uh, over any component description. And then we've got um, a little tag you can put on it. So it kind of shows you who, who modified it. Let's check out the add option. And what this will do is this will allow you to take any component and find a particular step and then choose the component and then select which assemblies you want to add it to. So I can say I want to put it on this one, on this one, and this one. We have an add all here as well, but that might not be used as much as it's used when replacing components. And then you would just click process to add the components to all those bill of materials. 
the subtract works in a pretty similar way. Here, I'd be picking all the components that I want to, any components I want to remove. And this, instead of replacing it with another component, this will just remove it all together from the bill of materials. And as soon as I pick the component here, it will list all the different assemblies that it's sitting on. And I can, again, add them one by one, or I can just add them all to the list. And then the copy bomb feature that we were looking at a moment ago, where I can take any existing assembly in the system and say, let's copy it over to any other existing assemblies so that I can then go. It kind of gives me that shortcut where I can then go and finish editing them after they've all been made to mirror image that original assembly. Here in the item screen, you'll notice that we've got this option right here, this, this tab called revisions. Okay, the idea behind revisions is to give you a way to keep track of the different versions and revisions of the bill of materials that you've gone through over time. At any time, I can come over to this tab, click on the button, and the only thing I really have to put in is a name. And then the system will add the new revision to the list of revisions right over here. At any time, I can double click on any of these revisions to actually open up a read-only version of that, that snapshot of the bill of materials from the time that that revert revision was created. Okay, so you can keep track of that using the revisions. We do have an option in the settings. If I come under the company preferences, there's an administrative option. Let's see if I can hunt it down. Uh, it's this guy right over here to auto generate bomb revisions every time a bomb is changed. Um, if you want to track every single time any change is made to a bill of materials, you can check that box. And as your users are going and changing the bill of materials, the system will auto generate revisions for you every single time the save is performed. Once you have your bill of materials in the system, we've got a couple of printouts you can use for it. Uh, some of the pretty standard ones is the typical bill of materials printout. And that's going to give us a breakdown of all the steps along with the components that each step has with the quantity and the cost. And just like any other form or report we have in the system, you can customize this, change it around, and have it look and feel the way that you want it to. If you're doing multiple levels of subassemblies, we've also got a neat one called the indented bill of materials. It's super cool. If you print that guy out, that's actually going to show you an indented version of the bill of materials going all the way down. So you can see here I've got my main assembly, then I've got my zero assembly, that's got the configured assembly, which has the default assembly, which got my homus in it, which is of course the most important thing. So you can see here how it goes all the way down, multiple levels um, down of subassemblies. Let's talk for a moment about uh, configurable bill of materials. Now, when you're creating your, your assembly here in the system and you're putting all your components on here, by default, without making any other changes, that's going to be the way we drop it on the work order when it actually goes into production. Once it's on the work order, you can go and change the components out, remove, add, change quantities, whatever work you need to do on the work order. However, there might be situations where in a perfect world, your sales team is able to actually modify what the build out is going to have in it without having to get to the point where they're creating the work order and making changes there. So really being able to configure your bill of materials on the sales floor. And we call that a configurable bomb. And the way to do that is to use our kit slash config tab. Okay. This kit slash config tab allows us to take any item that's in your bill of materials and specify whether or not it's completely optional or it can be swapped in and out for something else. Okay, so I'm going to come into my kit slash config area and I'm going to create a new component and we'll call it nail options. And I'm going to make the type here a variable type. That means that some option has to be picked 
for the nails, but I can pick and choose which one it's going to be when the order is being placed. And I always want to make sure that I'm linking it to the original component first. That's the first thing I want to do, which in this case is going to be nails. And perhaps now I want to give the user another option and I'll just pick really any item in here. It doesn't really matter. And so now what I'm doing is I'm saying that when the sale is being placed, not only is nails an option, but the salesperson can swap it out for any of these other variable items as well. Okay, and the way that I link that up, once I've actually put this variable configuration in the system, I can click on this configure bomb option and I can link any bomb items to the kit items. That tells me that when I'm configuring this particular item in the kit, it's going to affect this particular item in the bomb. So let's do one more. Let's do the circuit. How about that one? And this one will be a yes, no. The yes, no means that it's like an, almost like an upgradable. It's an option that the customer can either take or leave. And I'm going to link this one together. So now I've configured the nail option so the salesperson can pick and choose which nail the customer wants. And I've included the circuit option so the customer can pick and choose whether they want a circuit at all or they want no circuit on their order. So let's go ahead and place a new order so we can see what the interface looks like. And I'll just pick any customer. And we'll put the NC bot on here. And you'll notice that this configuration screen pops up. Now normally when I'm just putting an assembly item on a sales order or on a quote, I'm not going to get something like this. It's just going to add the line item and I'm done. Bob's your uncle. But as soon as I start to put in configuration rules, the salesperson is going to get prompted to pick and choose what option the customers want. Now for the nails, I have the option to either to swap it out for any of the other items that I've made available. So a, a good example for this would be like a computer. And perhaps every computer has got to have a hard drive. There's no question about it. But perhaps there's a solid state hard drive. There's a two ter terabyte hard drive instead of a one terabyte hard drive. So there might be a hard drive option on here. The user can't buy the computer with no hard drive at all. They've got to pick at least one hard drive. So that's a perfect example for a variable type of configuration. The yes, no would be completely optional. I can either check the box to have it or uncheck the box to leave it out of my build. A good example for this might be if you want to have a, um, a wireless card. Perhaps they don't need a wireless card. They can get a wireless card that's completely optional and up to the customer. That would be a yes, no type of configuration for your bill of materials. And then as the salesperson is picking and choosing these options, when they eventually go to create the work order, it's going to pick up the fact that these configuration options have been changed and it's going to handle them accordingly. And the last thing we're going to cover today is we're going to talk about exporting and importing your bill of materials. Um, here on the, on the item, you can see here we've got the export option um, and that will actually export your bomb in the exact format that you would be able to import it back in using the file, import, excel, items right over here. So if you've got bill of materials that you need to update, either it's a, it's a large bill of materials or you feel more comfortable doing it in Excel, maybe you've got some data in Excel already you want to copy and paste, um, you'll want to be exporting it directly out of the system into our Excel format. Okay, And that is also available here underneath the item list if I check, check, check any assemblies and then I go to export, that will allow me to create an exported document with all of that information, right? And let's take a quick look at that. And you're going to want to focus on the bomb steps and the bomb components tabs. The other ones will of course be populated, but if you're strictly focusing on trying to update your bill of materials, that's where that data is going to be. 
you'll see the steps that are going to be associated with each item in your item list. Right over here is the name of the steps. And in the components, you'll have your list of components associated along with their quantities, whether it's cost and, and one time, etc. Okay, and as soon as you're done editing that, you would simply hop back over to all orders, go to the file menu, import, and import it back in through Excel. All right, so we're going to open it up for questions now. And I will say that the the follow-ups we'll do on this, I, th I think the next one that we'll do is we'll try to cover work orders and some of the options that we have, um, including some of the more advanced options with managing and keeping track of your work orders and generating work orders in bulk. And we're also going to do one on the, uh, on the work order routing. So those will be some upcoming webinars that we're going to try and get in. All right, and you said what's the difference between an assembly and a kit? I think you pretty much went over that. Um, yeah, I'll, wanna... I'll cover that. I'll cover that a little bit more because I get the question just all the time. Okay, mm -hmm. kits kits in the all order system are sales tools. Okay, they're really just a sales tool. It's a way of creating an item or part number, an item name or part number that acts as a grouping or an umbrella that you could put multiple item options underneath maybe with special pricing and quantities to sell as a group right there is no actual kit item in stock could you maybe run a report and say based on the items that are in the kit how many of these could we put together sure but at no point could you actually look at your inventory and say oh i've got a unit five units ten units in stock and it's actually on your books as those items being in stock um, when you go to ship and invoice it you're not even really invoicing out the kit. You're really doing the individual items. That's really what's getting sold. All the revenue that shows up, all the quantities being depleted, it's all going under those individual items. So it's really just a sales tool where there's no production involved. You're really just putting it together when the order is being placed. Whereas with an assembly item, um, you can have those in stock. At any time, you can remove the items that go into assembly from your inventory and put the assembly in stock and run a report and see how many you have. All of the costs from the raw materials and components on assemblies get rolled up into the assembly item itself. And the assembly item itself is what's getting sold. That's what's bringing in the revenue, the cost of goods. All that is going through the assembly item. So the kit, not a true item, really just a sales tool. Whereas assemblies and bombs, those are real items, real inventory items that have inventory tracking. Um, and can have units in stock. All right, so the, the, the copy bomb option, I just got asked about the copy bomb option. The copy bomb option is actually in the latest build that we have. If you go on our website and you go to check for updates, I'm not going to have it right here, so I'm just going to go to numbercruncher.com. But if you click check for updates and it says there's an update, it'll bring you there. But if you do check for updates and it just says no, but you still want to just see, um, on our website, we have betas that we put out. So if I go to our support area and I go to software updates and I go to all orders, you'll see here our fully released version. And we'll probably do full releases maybe three or four times a year. And then in between full releases, we'll have betas where we're putting out some new features and fixes that you know maybe are, are available to customers on a limited basis. Not everybody's got it up and running. We don't send out emails about it because it's still in beta. You're welcome to email me or anybody on our team at any time to inquire about a beta, um, to ask if it's stable or anything like that. I will tell you that 6.2.56 is extremely stable. Really, the feature that it has that 55 doesn't have is the copy bomb. That's actually what we put it out for, um, was to get it in a couple of our, our clients' hands, users to try it out, give us some feedback. So if you're interested in the copy bomb feature, that's going to be available in 56. There was a question about uh, phantom bombs, but are, are we going to get into those in uh, one of our next webinars? Yeah, so what I was talking about, because phantom bombs tie in so tightly to work orders and a really advanced topic on work orders, I think we're going to save it for another uh, webinar that we do on production um, that involves creating sub-assemblies and then drilling down and flattening. Uh, the phantom bomb is going to be part of processing your work orders. So we'll, we'll, we'll roll that in when we do our next production webinar. And then uh, is there a way to create dynamic part numbers based on kits and configurable bombs? 
Uh, we actually have done something like that before, but it, it wouldn't be like a dynamic part number that would show up in your item list. We've kind of done it where, uh, based on the rules you give us, we are, we make it available on like printouts or in custom fields where we can populate it, but not where we actually take a configuration and then generate you know additional items in the item list, like all the different variations. We do a little bit of that with styles, where with our style manager, you can put in different attributes like a color, a size, a fabric, a, you know, whatever it might be. We, we have some people who do um, uh, commercial industrial lighting fixtures and they'll have the wattage and, the, and different things. And, um, and based on those, it'll generate a whole list of different items. Um, so that is something that we do have, but we don't have anything like that for kits or assemblies. But if you just needed some kind of a part number to be attached to it somewhere in the system, um, while it's not actually a new item in your item list, we might be able to talk about that. And there's a question here. Um, they say that they're on the latest version, but they don't have the copy bomb option. Maybe they're on five five. Right, they're probably on fifty five. I, I, yeah. So I already told them it's on the beta that we have on the uh, on the website. Okay. And uh, are we going to cover disassemblies in one of the future production yeah, series I think webinars? The, I think what we'll do is the next one that we do uh, work orders, we'll cover disassemblies as well. Okay. And um, do you see the question about estimated loss? Yeah, at this time, um, I don't think you can tie it to specific items. It's certainly something that we could discuss um, if you needed to have maybe loss factors or something like that associated. I'm assuming you're talking about the loss factor associated with just specific items. Right now, it's for the entire bill of materials. Um, so it would cover all of the different items. So that would have to be something that we would discuss. Are there any further questions you can ask now? And we'll, we're watching the chat. And once again, this is uh, part one of a three-part series on production. So the next couple webinars are going to be about production in particular. And right after this webinar, I'll be sending out an email with some notes from the webinar, as well as some links that I have from the knowledge base um, uh, helping with cost on bill of materials, what is a bill of materials, and batch sizes. All right. just want to thank everybody for attending. We always love having you here. Uh, be sure to follow up with us if there's anything uh, that you saw in the webinar that you still have questions about. And hope everybody has a great day. Bye now. Have a good one, everyone. Bye.